If coming out is like a baptism, then a pride parade is definitely confirmation. Both are social processes through which a social identity is constructed. The parade, which one usually attends when they're old enough, becomes a public recognition and celebration of the more private aspects of coming out. In the Roman Catholic tradition, at the age of discretion, usually between the ages of 13 and 18, confirmation serves as a, well, confirmation of that baptism that was traditionally done privately at infancy with just a few people present. The bishop, serving as a stand-in for Christ, formally recognizes your place alongside peers within the church. The newly confirmed becomes officially part of the communion of saints, past, present, and future. And with that designation, it is understood that their role now is to take on further responsibilities within that community. With rainbow flags in hand, while dressed in attire that one normally doesn't wear, including very little clothing and lots of glitter perhaps, marching an LGBTQ pride parade demonstrates that you're officially part of queer culture. Beginning with the Stonewall riots, Pride events have gone from direct political protest to a celebratory festival of LGBT life as it exists today. By its very existence, taking place within the heart of urban centers, Pride aims to raise consciousness of the fact that we're here and we're queer and it's our land too. The parade serves as a literal remapping of heteronormative physical space to include queer people and thus include them within the larger structures of society. It's a ritual designed to transform. One of the key components for this transformation is through the use of music, typically dance music, which provides a sort of sonic architecture marking the physical space of the parade route. Dance is a form of speech. Dance involves the body, the primary site and means through which queer individuals are made different. Our bodies face oppression because of how we relate to them and how we relate to others through them. So it makes sense that dance music and dancing provides a sense of freedom for many queer individuals because it allows them to have control and proudly display how they use their bodies. 1 Corinthians says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And King David took full advantage of that. In 2nd Book of Samuel, as the Ark of the Covenant was being brought into the city of Jerusalem, David danced before it and in front of all kinds of onlookers, naked. Well, in his underwear to be more specific. Now, remember what I said about David a few lessons ago? <laughs> this here is literally the first gay pride parade, and it's in the Bible. And, of course, some people were disgusted. Well, namely his first wife, calling it shameful. But she's probably still angry at the fact that David wanted to be more with her brother Jonathan than her. <laughs> so if coming out is baptism and pride is confirmation, where's communion? Well, what builds community? Drinking. This is not good. Drinking serves as a ritualistic purpose at Pride. Drinking before and during is part of the whole experience. Even after the parade ends, most people go out to bars and clubs even if the sun is still out. The way drinking occurs at these events actually serves a community building purpose, very similar to what you find in ritual meals within religion. Sharing food is a sign of acceptance and communion among those who partake of a sacred meal, but also can be a sign and means of experiencing spiritual strengthening. This is also the case with wine and other forms of intoxicants that have been used by native cultures as a means of experientially communicating with gods or for feeling their power. The right of eating and drinking together is clearly a right of incorporation, a physical and spiritual union. A union by this means may be permanent, but more often it lasts only during the period of digestion or until the beer runs out. It's growing on me. On a more intimate level, hooking up is also a form of communion, and believe me, that's also part of pride. But since we've already talked about the sexual undertones of the Eucharist in a previous lesson, we won't go back there again. But just understand that by the end of pride, all three sacraments of queer initiation have been fulfilled. You are a fully initiated LGBT member. 
And with that designation, it is understood that your role is to take on further responsibilities within that community. Now, one of the primary responsibilities is to support inclusion, equal rights. And this begins at home by looking at how we treat members of our own community. I say this because there's a lot of horizontal violence that takes place between us. That's when a marginalized group turns on each other. In the queer community, we tend to push blame on the more exotic subculture or fringe groups within the community for failures to obtain equal rights. We're not like them, we say, or we compete against each other in a form of oppression Olympics. When campaigning in the 2020 Democratic primary, openly gay former mayor of South Bend, Indiana, Pete Buttigieg, faced a lot of opposition from within the queer community for his remarks that he doesn't associate in the gay scene, resulting in members of our own community calling him not gay enough. One could call Buttigieg a colonized queer. That is someone living under the dominion of heterosexuals, heterosexuality, and heteronormativity, and has assimilated to it. This internal fighting calls to mind a similar feud that occurred within the Christian community about two decades after Jesus died. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is made aware of infighting over who was baptized by whom, as if it's some badge of honor. Some say, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Christ. Paul asks, has Christ been divided? Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. The queer community must not become new Pharisees that go around judging the level of holiness of others and excluding them from the table. To categorize people is against what the word queer stands for. Queer transcends labels. Queer transcends boundaries. You shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. If we expect our oppressors to do likewise, we must be open to people, to ideas, and to experiences that are different from our own. In many U.S. cities, Cleveland included, African-American LGBT people hold separate pride events because they feel marginalized within the queer community because of the color of their skin. When one thinks gay, they typically think white, cis, male. Considering pride began at Stonewall, which had a frequently black clientele, as a queer community, we owe people of color for our advancements in equal rights. So we cannot allow this to happen. Jesus brought together a diverse group of people, yet churches remain the most segregated places in America today. We can do better. Later in 1 Corinthians, Paul provides a model for the church that I feel best reflects how we should view and approach community as a human body with many parts. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. 
But God has so arranged the body, given the greater honor to the inferior members, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, why this passage is still relevant for us today, here's me from a few years ago to explain. In that body, the Holy Spirit gives each and every one of us specific gifts, also known as charisms, that help make Christ present in the world. In other words, God gives us all unique traits that will play a unique role in the greater church. Now, a charism isn't always something religious, like singing or preaching. A person might simply find bugs fascinating, and God needs someone to tend to his bugs. So God plants a desire, a unique desire, in specific individuals with a fascination towards bugs so that that person can take that fascination, study it, go off into the world, and essentially be a steward for God's creation when it comes to bugs. When we look inside ourselves and see what makes us special, we will discover key signs that are actually linked to what God desires for us to do in this world. This is known as vocation or calling. And he expects us to use what he's given us. We can see this illustrated in Matthew 25's parable of the talents, where a master gives money to each of his servants according to their abilities. Sometime later, when the master returns to settle the accounts, each servant except one doubled their investments. The one who didn't told the master that since he was afraid, he buried the talent in the ground. Pay attention to that line. He hid because of fear. Needless to say, the master wasn't pleased, calling the servant wicked and lazy. When God gives us a gift according to our abilities, he holds us accountable for how we use them. And I honestly, sincerely, without a doubt, believe that God makes certain people queer as a gift. What? To do something for this world, to do something for this community, this body of Christ. We just have to take a step back to explore how queerness can be a gift. And I'd like for you to think about that for a moment. How can queerness build up that body of Christ? According to the kin selection hypothesis, more children survive and thrive when they have LGB aunts and uncles. Heterosexual parents raising a child often benefit from having a third person around to help out, and that third person would be most available if they didn't have children of their own. The whole group benefits. So there's a queer gift, and you know, there's always been that joke when a Catholic couple has multiple children, and because they always have that one kid who they claim is going to be the priest in the family. You know that one kid, you know that type. He isn't interested in sports, nor is he interested in dating, tends to keep to himself, is a little bit more artistic and creative. He's a very gentle soul to be around, right? <laughs> yeah, the parents say he's the religious one, but we know what he is. Yeah, he's, he's, he's the gay one. Queer people don't harm the children. We help the children. And we help straight people with their own dang children. <laughs> to disown an LGB family member is like shooting yourself in the foot. Let's go even a step further. Genesis 9, God says, This is the sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow is a bridge between the heavenly and terrestrial realms. In 1978, artist and drag queen Gilbert Baker created the rainbow flag for use in a San Francisco parade. Ever since, Christian conservatives argue that the LGBT community has hijacked the symbol from God and has perverted its meaning. But I would like to suggest the possibility that it's the rainbow from this flag that God was actually talking about in Genesis 9. That the LGBT community has not hijacked something from God, but is actually playing a role in the fulfillment of a promise by God. 
In other words, the rainbow and the people it represents is a sign of God, not a sin against God. We can be the means of God's promise of love for humanity. And there have been certain people from within our queer community that have exemplified that that have excelled in demonstrating God's promise of love and hope for humanity. We call these people queer saints. And no, I'm not talking about the traditional saints who may have been queer, like St. Francis of Assisi or St. Sebastian, but people from within the community who could be considered models of holiness. And of course, there's Matthew Shepard, a 21-year-old gay martyr who brought international attention to anti-LGBTQ hate crimes when he died in October 1998. Matthew was brutally attacked near Laramie, Wyoming by two men who later claimed that they were driven temporarily insane by gay panic due to Shepard's alleged sexual advances. Matthew was beaten and left to die. His funeral was picketed by members of the anti-gay Westboro Baptist Church with hostile signs such as Man in Hell and No Fags in Heaven. Not allowing the protest to overtake Shepherd's service, one of his friends, Romaine Patterson, organized a group to wear white robes and gigantic wings resembling angels to block the protesters. Another example of the queer community assimilating religious imagery and rhetoric to combat hate. The next year, Angel Action was founded. Matthew's parents set up the Matthew Shepherd Foundation, an LGBT nonprofit organization that runs education, outreach, and advocacy programs. In October 2009, President Obama signed the Matthew Shepherd and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act into law, which broadens the federal hate crimes law to cover violence based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Like traditional Christian saints, Matthew Shepherd has become a cultural icon inspiring dozens and dozens of paintings, films, plays, songs, and other artistic work. In his death, many Americans saw a repetition of the crucified Christ. Gay bashers beat him, hung him on a fence as a message to other queer people. And then he died. Playwright Terence McNally writes, Beaten senseless and tied to a split rail fence in near zero weather, arms akimbo in a grotesque crucifixion, he died as agonizing a death as another young man who had been tortured and nailed to a wooden cross at a desolate spot outside Jerusalem, known as Golgotha, some 1998 years earlier. They died as they live, as brothers. Jesus Christ did not die in vain because his disciples lived to spread his story. It is this generation's duty to make certain Matthew Shepard did not die in vain either. The book of Deuteronomy says that anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. Well, obviously, we know that's no longer true when you consider what happened to Jesus. It was St. Paul who reclaimed the crucifixion as a source of triumph and pride for the church, rather than something of shame and embarrassment. For without the crucifixion, where would the resurrection be? The resurrection of the dead, whether literal as Christians believe or symbolic through the disciples' ongoing ministry, is proof that no matter what happens, love will always win. <laughs> and that is a reason enough to be out and proud. 
someone brought this to a party. No one drank it. That's why I have it. It's not bad. Black cherry. <laughs>